Hello, welcome to the Eugenics Podcast. I'm Patrick Merricks. I'm Mario Sturda. Morning, Marius. How are you? Good morning, Patrick. I'm very well, thank you. Yourself? Wonderful, thank you. So today we're talking about LGBTQ, its connections to uh, the eugenics movement historically. So let's begin by looking at a relatively recent article titled um, No Gay Gene. So um, what does this mean, Marius? We're talking here about the genetic manipulation of human behavior and human sexuality. And ultimately, uh, at the, the crux of the matter is whether there is a biological basis or genetic basis for um, homosexuality. If we can discover a gay gene, if we can, then we should accept it as normal and natural and it should not be uh, criminalized, pathologized, eugenicized uh, and so forth. So this is a, a, a century, if no longer, debate about uh, whether any, uh, any queer uh, body, any queer sexuality uh, is the result of uh, inborn congenital or hereditary predispositions or it is acquired later in life through uh, contact with people or through education or through uh, social environments. So we've got some pioneers in the study of um, human sexuality here. So what would you like to say about these three individuals? Indeed, these are probably three important contributors to the debate on homosexuality and, uh, and queerness uh, at the beginning of the 20th century in particular. Avelok Hellis uh, is a very important British uh, sexologist. He writes this book on, on sexual inversion, as he called it, at the end of the 19th century, first in German, because it was difficult to have it published in, in England, and it was translated. And he preferred the term inversion rather than homosexuality, although the term existed at the time, and it was introduced in, into English in 1890s. Um, but simply because he wanted to depathologize, uh, normalize, and make it acceptable to, uh, to, uh, to talk about homosexuality. And homosexuality was not something that was uh, uh, abnormal in this way. He said, after all, the animal world uh, have, provides many cases of homosexuality in non-European culture. It's rather indifferent to homosexuality and so on and so forth. So he tried to, um, to make it acceptable uh, and normal and to highlight at the same time through the case studies he presented of both men and women, mostly men though, um, the scientific and intellectual achievements of people considered to be um, queer uh, or homosexuals. So that's one, one, one interpretation, uh, and it became extremely influential. The other one is provided by, by someone like Ernst Rudin, who really connected directly homosexuality to eugenics and racial hygiene and considered uh, queer people to be detrimental to the progression of the race, to the future of the national community. Uh, this is a very clear heterosexual normative eugenics that insists that the purpose uh, of the individual is to reproduce and to reproduce well for the future of the race. Um, at the same time, uh, around the uh, 1920s, uh, endocrinology becomes very influential and emerges as an accepted academic discipline. And one contribution comes from Italy, uh, from Nicola Pende, who, uh, amongst, amongst other things, uh, decided that any form of sexuality in any form of um, what he called uh, uh, abnormality uh, can be treated through uh, hormonal um, invasive methods. Uh, so as long as you decide that there is a, a, a hormonal or, um, or problem with the constitution of the individual, that be corrected through treatment. Uh, uh, so that's the endocrinological school and the biotypological schools that was um, very influential in the 1920s that tried to um, help, as it were, uh, individuals uh, considered to be queer. And um, it was very influential, particularly in countries uh, like Italy and also in, in, in Latin America. So as these disciplines develop, we've got a bit of the, um, some chronological milestones here. So could you talk us through these? We're returning to Germany uh, because this is where sexual science emerged uh, at the beginning of the, of, of the 20th century. 
The term itself it was coined by a German dermatologist, Ivan Bloch, who together with, with the other uh, person um, who's uh, depicted here, uh, Magnus Hirschfeld, uh, created the Medical Society for Sexual Science and Eugenics in, in Berlin in 1913. But then Hirschfeld uh, became very prominent and well known uh, across the world for promoting uh, his uh, interpretation of um, homosexuality or what he called intermediate sexual types. He established an institute to, this, to, to discuss and to research uh, this um, in, in Berlin. He promoted um, his um, theories through exhibitions um, he organized in Germany and also in, in, in London in the 1920s and through films. One very important film uh, that uh, um, it's really a landmark in the LGBTQ uh, history uh, is produced in 1919, a silent film called Different from the Others. The aim was similar to Ellis's aim, namely to depathologize, de exoticize homosexuality and not consider it to be a form of degeneration or uh, a, a threat to the eugenic future of the society and of the race. He too, like the others we mentioned, was uh, quite keen to endorse eugenics, not negative eugenics, he was very critical of sterilization, but of course, the other forms of eugenics he was uh, quite happy to promote. You mentioned earlier that it was a lot of focus was on men, but not exclusively. No, on the contrary, uh, even though uh, Ellis in his book, uh, Sexual Inversion, do not really elaborate too much on the same-sex relationship between women. We know that his wife, Edith Ellis, uh, was a lesbian and uh, he, she served as one of the examples uh, in the book and in fact, to some extent, prompted, prompted her husband to write about this topic. Uh, so we have this uh, uh, interesting relation between uh, feminism, uh, eugenics and, uh, 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 and same-sex uh, and queer uh, uh, discussions about female sexuality that are very popular in, in, in Britain at the beginning of the 20th century. We have one example here, the, the modernist journal Free Woman, who discuss um, issues related to gender sexuality and uh, homosexuality. Maybe not as much about female homosexuality, but uh, nevertheless. In Germany, however, the conversation, particularly in the 1920s, is more developed. We have this example of the journal Die Freundin, who was openly uh, uh, gay and, uh, um, and, and in support of lesbianism. But you also have feminists, um, such as Anna Ruling, who addresses the issue directly in one of the speeches she gave in 1904. Feminists, it ought to be said, had a very uneasy relationship with lesbianism and, uh, uh, and homosexuality in general. And uh, it was not something that um, it was um, necessarily on their agenda. However, someone like uh, Edith Ellis was very keen to promote a form of what she calls spiritual um, eugenics. In other words, uh, it is important to look at uh, uh, queer uh, women as contributors spiritually and culturally to the benefit and the future of the nation and race, and their contribution should not be neglected. So she really stressed the spiritual and intellectual contribution rather than the biological, rather than the reproductive. Uh, abilities of the female body. So then we move to Nazi Germany and it sort of takes a different turn, this story. So how is the com this community affected? The story becomes tragic during the 1930s in Nazi Germany uh, and the views put forward by eugenicists such as Ernst Rudin, who is someone who uh, also um, contributed to the drafting of the sterilization law of 1933 that view becomes um, adopted by the Nazi regimes and um, LGBTQ community is considered to be uh, an enemy of the state. Um, they are considered to be uh, anti-eugenic uh, and they are considered to be a, a, a threat to the future of the race. So they are persecuted, they are sent to concentration camps uh, and many of them uh, die um, uh, there. So. Um, that's something that it ought to be remembered constantly when we talk about the Holocaust, um, the suffering of the LGBTQ community during Nazi Germany. So returning to present day, we've got um, 
an article from the sort of past decade about um, transgendering children. So what is this development? How is it connected to what we've been talking about today? It connects, interestingly, to debates uh, in the 1920s, particularly in the endocrinological community, about the possibility of um, redirecting, retransforming, uh, returning, as it were, uh, an individual to its alleged uh, natural path be that male or female. So if we have uh, hormones that can be treated, if we have drugs that can uh, help uh, with that, then uh, what it's called now the gender identity disorder um, and uh, particularly affect affecting trans people uh, can be uh, resolved. It's still the same discussion with which we started, uh, namely, is this to be considered a biological uh, issue or not? If it is biological, it can be sorted out by science. Then we can either uh, correct it or uh, nurture it, but at the same time we can decide that some prospective parents may want to uh, weed out, breed out the, the gay gene, breed out the trans gene, breed out any deviation from the gender accepted roles in our society. So we have the eternal debate um, that continues to this day between those who say it has to be accepted as normal and it has to be uh, integrated fully into our society, or you have those who say, well, there's absolutely uh, uh, the possibility of eugenically uh, steering the future of our children and the future of our society in this way. Well, thank you, Marius, for another important, um, very engaging, um, powerful discussion today. And thanks, everyone, for viewing. So once again, Marius, thank you and see you next time. Thank you, Patrick. Until next time.